the design was designated the Boeing Model 733. Boeing actually started work on supersonic passenger airliners very early on, right at the beginning of the 1950s. But in a kind of research way, is this possible? Where, is, where are the engines going? Where is the metallurgy going? But what you begin to see is by the end of the 1950s, they're starting to get quite serious about it. They're beginning to think this can be done. With Kennedy's call for America to actually build the SST, the Model 733 could become reality at last. Throughout late 1963, the three contenders for the prize of building the American SST, Boeing, Lockheed and North American, worked in secret on their designs. Who would win? And with what kind of plane? More importantly, could the late American competitor still capture the market? In late 1963, metal for the first Concorde was already being cut. Could America catch up? There was a recent precedent. The British Comet had been the first jet airliner in service in the 1950s. But a series of fatal crashes revealed serious design flaws that had resulted from the Comet being rushed into airline operation to beat the Americans. As a result, the Boeing 707 came from nowhere to dominate the skies of the 1950s and 1960s. The Americans came late to the supersonic race. They wanted to leapfrog the Europeans. And so they decided to go faster. The Europeans were going for Mark 2.2, which meant they could build Concorde out of existing materials using existing technology. The Americans decided to go way up to Mark 3, through the so-called heat barrier, which meant that um, because of the stresses on the plane at those speeds and the heat that would build up on the fuselage, they'd had to find, they had to use new materials. So the Americans were, were going for a technological breakthrough to try and get ahead of the Europeans and bury the competition. To beat the competition, both at home and in Europe, Boeing proposed a plane that was far bigger than Concorde. It was designated the 2707. Boeing realized that if they were going to beat the Anglo-French Concorde, they would have to be bigger, better and faster. So their design was for a faster aircraft and for one that would carry two and a half times the number of passengers as Concorde. So instead of 120, we're looking at 277 passengers on board. To help design its new 2707, Boeing built an amazing life-size mock-up. The aircraft was 93 meters long a third bigger than Concorde. There were 277 seats, 30 first class and 247 tourist. Two and a half times the number of passengers the small Concorde was designed to carry. The seating layout in the 2707 was revolutionary. Till then, seating in planes was two cramped seats on either side of a single aisle, which made planes seem very claustrophobic. Boeing decided that in order to entice people into this, uh, this new aircraft with these fancy speeds, they'd have to offer a bit of something else. And so they made the fuselage bigger so they could get more seating in. Today we are very used to, to three, three sets of seats, two aisles, but this was the first time when Boeing was developing the supersonic airliner that they decided to introduce that into an aircraft. By comparison, the Concorde has a very narrow fuselage and the old-fashioned two-abreast single-aisle layout. The 2707 would be powered by four massive turbojets, each capable of generating nearly three tons of thrust. At takeoff, the 2707 would weigh over 300 tons. The Boeing 2707 had two other very interesting features. The first was a drooping nose, not unlike we see on Concorde today, to allow the pilots much better visibility in takeoff and landing, and then to be flicked up for that needle-like high-speed flight. The second design feature was also 
uh, to do with the differences between low speeds for approach and landing and high speeds uh, in supersonic, and that was the swing wing. The wing was able to pivot for those slow speed areas, making it easier and safer to fly when taking off and landing. But then when it was up above the Atlantic or Pacific or wherever it was going to go and approaching its speeds of Mach 2, you could sweep the wing back, wings back and get a very similar effect to the Delta. The wings on the mock-up of the Boeing 2707 could be moved manually from fully aft with a 72 degree sweep to fully extended with a 30 degree sweep. The Boeing supersonic airliner was really pushing the boundaries of aviation technology. They were going to go faster, they were going to go faster for longer, which meant new materials, new kinds of engines, new kinds of avionics. It was a, it was a risk. One group who thought that were the Lockheed Company, who were busy with their rival SST, the Lockheed L2000. The Lockheed design for a supersonic airliner was simple, elegant, beautiful. No complex moving parts like a swing wing. They'd adopted the narrow delta that everyone knew was, was going to work. It was within the boundaries of what was possible. Uh, they, they were minimizing the risks uh, and that's why it was, it was a serious competitor. As the time for submitting final design entries drew closer, Boeing was still plotting to outdo the competition. As the design process went on, it became obvious that the, the, the Boeing entry was going to be terribly complex, terribly expensive. That made the airlines who were going to have to buy and use the thing frightened. So Boeing started adding on more and more passengers in the hope that it could make a profit uh, that would uh, make up for the escalating costs of the aircraft in the first place. Size does help you a little bit on efficiency, at least it has on the other airplanes. And so uh, uh, obviously you can get, you can go overboard and be too fast, but too big, but uh, uh, I think that we felt the Concorde was, uh, was, was too small to be a successful uh, uh, system. It was the last day of 1966 when the final design winner was announced. It was the revolutionary Boeing design. I think it was a very, uh, a very tough competition. The reason we won the configuration was not necessarily that the airlines liked our configuration any better. Uh, my personal opinion is that, that I think that they felt that they would rather have Boeing build their commercial airplane than the other two manufacturers. Because uh, we were in the process of building uh, commercial airplanes at that time and been working with the airlines. And my personal opinion is that uh, we were picked as a company, not as a design. It was a surprise that Boeing won because they had so little experience in building working supersonic aircraft. I mean, they were famous for the B-52 bomber, which is subsonic. Uh, everyone else, I mean, Convair, Lockheed had built large and fairly successful supersonic air aircraft. So this was, this was the new guy on the block suddenly being, being given the job and everyone thought, can they do it? Boeing predicted that if design and construction of prototypes began early in 1967, the first flight could be made in early 1970. The first aircraft could then be ready for airline service in mid-1974. They were talking nonsense. They had no idea of the problems they were about to face. The main problem in designing the Boeing supersonic airliner can be summed up in one word, the weight. This thing just got fat, it got heavier and heavier. It wasn't gonna make money. They had to then strip out weight. And in the end, the biggest weight penalty was gonna be the mechanism to make the wings swing. As we got beyond the preliminary design stage to build it, the weight got too heavy. The empty weight got too heavy. That was the main problem. Uh, the weight just got out of hand. And we couldn't meet the weight statement that we'd estimated for the, for the configuration at the start. The project slammed to a halt for a year as Boeing considered alternatives. In October 1968, Boeing emerged with what was virtually a complete redesign. There was only one way to solve the weight penalty problem, that was to take the swing wing out. Boeing's swing wing uh, disappeared because, mostly because of the extra weight. That, that, that huge hinge in there was very, very heavy. 
The 2707 was also reduced in size. Seating was reduced to 234 passengers, though that was still bigger than Concorde. And now, a new problem appeared to haunt the project and eventually kill it. The sonic boom. We knew it existed, uh, but frankly, I didn't think it was that bad. The sonic boom that the airplanes we were talking about was like thunder and lightning where the thunder hits about two miles away. And I guess I just didn't figure it was that bad. In order to explore the effects of the sonic boom on, for example, urban areas, the American Air Force conducted an experiment in 1964, uh, which is something I don't think we would ever contemplate doing today. And what they wanted to do was see what effect it had on an urban area. So they tried to, uh, they flew supersonic bombers over Oklahoma City with sonic booms or waves of shocked air passing all the time. The result was that in a very short period of time, they had around uh, 8,000 very vocal uh, complaints uh, and around 5,000 complaints for, uh, for or claims for damages. In 1967, immediately after Boeing had been selected to build the 2707, Dr. William Shirtliff, a scientist at Harvard University, organized the Citizens League against the sonic boom. Well, you know, actually there were so many technical and economic uh, hurdles that had to be addressed for an airplane like this, uh, not the least of which was...